Good morning. How's everybody? Good? Everybody excited? We got Red Raiders out here? Yeah. I know we don't have any Aggies because y'all would be too embarrassed to come after that, right? Whoop, you lost. And I'm, and I'm struggling to say something about the Longhorns because, one, I don't want to hurt your feelings, right? I don't know, you know, 15-yard penalty for, uh, for a horns down. I figured y'all are going to, you know, say it's a sin here pretty quick. So I'm trying to be careful. But you also almost beat Alabama, and then you play us in a couple weeks. So I'm trying to be kind of careful about that one, right? Yeah. Hey, it is great to see you all this morning. Uh, glad everybody's here. If you are with us on the live stream, we're excited that you are joining us that way. If you would, if you would go to firstsalawater.org. Got to catch my breath getting all excited about football um, and go to the connect card up there we would love to um, reach out to you and connect with you in that way if you are a first-time guest here this morning we are so thankful that you're here there is a welcome home card I meant to grab one there's a welcome home card right in front of you at the pew in front of you if you would grab that fill that information out um, the cool thing is if you'll do, do that and turn that into the uh, offering plate then we will connect with you by bringing you a hot apple pie, homemade hot apple pie. So you'll definitely want to do that. Um, I want to remind everybody this morning that there's a sign right over here that says, how can I pray for you? We have a prayer team here that is praying right now. Um, and we want to, we want to take, care of, take care of you in that way if you are needing prayer this morning. So um, right now, anytime during the sermon, after the sermon, if you need, if you need prayer, Head over to that sign right outside in the hallway there, and we'll get you taken care of, too. Um, this morning, we are so thankful that you're here once again, and uh, we want you to look around, see if there's someone that you don't know. Stand up, uh, extend your hand out to somebody, shake somebody's hand, give them a hug. Um, it's good to see you. The anniversary of uh, a really, uh, a really horrible day in the life of our uh, nation. Many of you remember probably where you were uh, on September the 11th of 2001. You remember exactly what you were doing uh, on this day, uh, on this day 20, 21 years ago. And uh, I think it's important for us to just kind of pause and uh, and think about and think about that. There are people all over the world right now who are who are uh, living in the kind of uh, fear and the kind of anxiety that you and I experienced uh, experienced so many years ago. And, um, and so I think this is a wonderful opportunity for us to pause and remember and, and pray for, for peace, that God's peace would come, that his kingdom would come on earth as it is in heaven. So would you join me in doing that this morning before we begin worshiping? Let's pray together. Father, we do, we remember, um, we remember uh, that dark day, Lord, we remember the loss of life. We remember, uh, we remember the brave uh, men and women who actually, who actually sacrificed their lives trying to help uh, others and trying to rescue others. Um, we remember this morning how it felt for us uh, to feel afraid and to not know what was going on. And um, we acknowledge, God, that there are people all over the world who are experiencing that same thing this morning. They're feeling that same way today. And they're living, through, uh, they're living through violence and hatred and war. 
But we know, Lord God, that your kingdom has come, is coming, will come. We know that you are restoring all things to right relationship with you and that you are at work in the world that we live in. God, we pray for your peace. More importantly, Lord, we pray that we would be agents of your peace in the world. We pray that you would deliver your peace into this world through us. That's what we want, Lord God. Do that in us as we worship you this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Accepted. 
for the, for the advancement of your kingdom. And we trust that in that pursuit, you've called us all here. And I pray, Lord God, that you would anoint us with understanding, God, that you would empower us and embolden us to do what we are called to do in our relationships, in our communities. God, I pray that we would honor you and that from that you would bring about your will in this place for us. We love you. We ask all these things in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So uh, before, before we start this morning, if, if you've joined us maybe for the first time today, we're in a series called From This Day Forward, and we're actually talking about six commitments uh, that, that we can make in our marriages that will, that will help to ensure that we have healthy marriages, fail-proof marriages, and so we've been talking about that. Before we get started, though, this morning, I just want to acknowledge like the words that we just sang. Um, I, I want to acknowledge that there are probably some folks here this morning, and you feel like, for whatever reason, you're sinking beneath the waves. You feel, uh, you feel beaten and battered by the storms of this life, and maybe that's true even in your marriage. And as we were singing those words, it was really difficult maybe for you to say, um, I will call upon your name, I'll keep my eyes above the waves. Maybe, maybe that was hard for you this morning because it feels increasingly more difficult, maybe impossible. And I just want to pause this morning, and if you're listening on the live stream or if you're here this morning and that's where you are, I, wanna, I, I just want to say I, we, I love you, we're with you, I understand how difficult and painful life sometimes is, marriage can sometimes be, and the reason why we're doing this is because we want to minister to one another through those difficult times, and I just want to say that to you before we get started. Can I do that? Six commitments. Six commitments that you and I can make in our marriages that will help to ensure that we have healthy marriages, fail-proof marriages, those those commitments, um, those commitments are, uh, those commitments are seek God. Um, last week we talked about fighting fair, serve selflessly, have fun, stay pure, never give up. Six things that you and I can commit to in our relationships and in our marriages that will help to ensure that they're healthy. We talked about fighting fair last week. I don't know about you, but that was super convicting for me. Had a tough time. If there was ever a sermon that I should not have been allowed to preach, it was last week. And then I started to prepare for this week, and I was like, no, no, maybe this one is the one. So I feel like it's going to be like that every week. So, uh, but this week we're going to be talking about serving selflessly. And I want to say this. Sometimes, uh, sometimes in the morning, Amy and I will, will sit together in the morning, and we'll be drinking coffee together. And, and, uh, and we'll, that's our time to kind of hang out and talk a little bit. And then, but sometimes also we'll, be, we'll have stuff to do. And like Amy will be on her phone, like, you know, trying to answer emails or do stuff like that. And, and, and we'll, be, we'll be hanging out, you know, there in the living room and, and, uh, and I will begin to feel as if, you know, I, I'm sure that whatever Amy is doing right now is important, but how could it possibly be more important than me, right? And I, I wake up, y'all, in the morning, and when the moment that my feet hit the ground, I am ready to go, okay? I wouldn't necessarily say I'm a morning person, but when I'm up, I am up, right? And so I will immediately start to joke around and try to be funny and try to get Amy to pay attention to me because... It just, it, I don't understand how Amy could not constantly be enthralled in my presence. You know what I mean? Uh, that's just who I am. That's kind of, I need to, this is going to be a surprise to you, but I need to be the center of attention. I, it's super important. So if anyone's attention is directed someplace other than me, I'm like, what's wrong right now? What is wrong, right? I, please pay attention to me, right? The reason I'm like that is because I'm really selfish, Okay. I, have, I am at my core, right? Essentially, I'm a selfish person. And some of you, when I said that, you chuckled a little bit. Guess what? You are too, all right? You are too. We all are. We all are essentially selfish people. And that's why what we're going to talk about this morning is really important because the problem is it's impossible to have healthy relationships, to have a healthy marriage when we're focused on our own desires, when we're focused on our own needs, when we're focused on our own happiness. Selfishness is the enemy of your marriage. Selfishness is the enemy of every important relationship in your life. And so that's why we're talking about what we're talking about this morning. The Apostle Paul in Philippians, beginning with uh, chapter 2, verse 1, the 
the Apostle Paul has some, some things to say to the church in Philippi, and I want us to look at this together. We're going to read it together, and then we're going to talk about it a little bit. So Philippians 2, verse 1, here's what the Apostle Paul says to the church in Philippi. He says, Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort from His love? Any fellowship together in the Spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Thinking of others is better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. So there's a couple of things that you need to know about Paul and about his relationship with the church in Philippi. Paul loved the church in Philippi, and this church had been a, a, a real encouragement to him during a really difficult season in his life. In fact, some scholars even think that Paul is writing this letter to the church in Philippi while he's in prison. And so, and so he's in a difficult place, and this church has really reached out and encouraged him and lifted him up. He loves these people. He even tells the, the, the Philippians that they have a special place in his heart, right? And, and, and that they really have encouraged him and stood with him while he was in prison. And, so, and now he's so proud of them because of the way they're sharing the gospel. And so he's filled with joy when he thinks about them. But guess what? His joy is not complete. We find that out. In Philippians 2, 2, chapter 1, his joy is not complete. Why? Obviously, it's because there was some disunity within the church, and Paul wants to deal with it here. He wants to remind them how important that is. And here's why, here's why that's meaningful for us this morning. I, I would venture to say that there's a, couple, there's, there's a couple here this morning. There's some marriages represented here this morning. And when people, when people look at you, when people see you from the outside, they probably think, man, those guys are just killing this marriage thing, right? They're just rocking it. They, everything seems to be going right for them. They've got it all together. And yes, man, you're, you're, you're doing great in your career. You're doing great with your kids. You're, you're, doing, you're doing great, and you're involved in church together. And everyone who comes into contact with you is like, oh, what an encouragement that couple is. How awesome that couple is. How meaningful the relationships we have with that couple really are. And everyone's like, man, we love them, right? But the reality is, that in our relationship with one another, sometimes, sometimes there's a crack in that foundation of unity that we have with each other. And however great or however awesome we look on the outside to everybody else, even how good we may be as a couple at helping other people or doing nice things for other people in our marriage, in our relationship, there's a problem. This unity is happening. And just like Paul, when he wanted to deal with that with the church in Philippi, we've got to deal with it this morning. Some of us, some of us um, have experienced it. And pa Paul says to the church, he's like, he's like, look, is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Well, sure. I mean, you know that. Is there, is there any comfort? Of course. You've experienced that. Is there any fellowship with God's Holy Spirit? You bet. You guys have that. You have all of that. Are your hearts tender? Yes, your hearts are tender, right? All those things are going on. He tells them all those things are going on. I know it. I see it, right? But guess what? My joy is not full. My joy is not complete because I know I know that there's an issue. And some of us have experienced the grace of God, the reality of his love. We have tender, compassionate hearts toward other people, all these things. But those closest to us aren't experiencing that from us. Our spouses aren't experiencing all of that from us. The foundation upon which all of that is supposed to be built is cracked, disunity at home. And so Paul says to the church at Philippi, there's three things that he challenges them to, and those three things I believe God is challenging us to in our marriages, but also just in our relationships this morning, and I want us to talk about it. The first one is unity. The first one's unity. Paul says this to the church in Philippi. He says uh, in verse 2, he says, Then make me truly happy, by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and one purpose. And so there's three things, when Paul's talking about unity, there's three specific things that he means when he's talking about it in this passage. The first thing is, he wants for the church in Philippi to be of the same mind. 
He's challenging the church to be on the same page together. He wants them to zero in on the gospel, zero in on the truth about God's love as revealed in Jesus. He wants for them to be super focused and all pulling in the same direction. Agree together, right? That's what's important. That's what he wants. But listen, just in case maybe you didn't know this, right? Uh, unity, agreement, requires sacrifice. Agreement requires sacrifice. It's hard to have that same kind of agreement in our marriages, isn't it? It's hard for us sometimes to be on the same page. We have all these things that we imagine are so important. We have priorities, and our priorities don't always agree. The truth is that, the truth is that Amy and I, uh, my wife and I could not be more different, really. We are polar opposites, okay? Uh, she, she is, you know, way more I- introverted of a person. She's really together. She, she, you know, she always has a plan for everything. And I am completely extroverted and a total dumpster fire at all times. Like, I have no idea what's going on ever. And I'm just walking through life with my hair on fire. If I had hair, that's what would be happening to me all the time. So we couldn't be more different. And sometimes, sometimes it's, it's we, because we approach things from completely different ways, sometimes it's difficult for us to, to feel like we're on the same page. But here's the thing. Having the same mind about things sometimes means that, that I have to sacrifice some things that I believe are really important in order to prioritize things that Amy believes are important. Unity sometimes means that we have to sacrifice. And sometimes it's the other way around. Sometimes Amy has to sacrifice things that she thinks are important in order to prioritize what I believe is important. And so when we find ourselves in sharp disagreement about how we prioritize stuff, right, it's our responsibility to go before God and pray together and seek God's direction so that we can be on the same page. That's our responsibility as a couple. Listen, are you struggling with unity in your marriage today? Maybe it's because you're unwilling to lay down your own priorities. Let me ask you a couple of questions, and I want you to think about these. Would you be willing to go before God together with your spouse and ask God to give you the same mind about a a point of conflict in your marriage? Would you be willing to do that? And here's the thing. In order for you to do that, you have to be willing to surrender what you want to what God wants. Would you be willing to do that? Would you be willing to surrender to God this morning your need to be right? Now look, as soon as I say that, guys, I know absolutely how difficult that is to do. I fail at it all the time. But in order for us to be unified, we have to have the same mind. We also have to have the same love. You hear what Paul said next. He said, then make make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another. Same love. I want to share with you another passage of Scripture, if I could. It's Psalm 133. Uh, if you have your Bible, turn over to Psalm 133. If you got it on your phone or whatever, uh, look at Psalm 133. Here's what it says. Psalm 133 says, How wonderful and pleasant it is when brothers live together in harmony. For harmony is as precious as the anointing oil that was poured over Aaron's head that ran down his beard and onto the border of his robe. Harmony is as refreshing as the dew from Mount Hermon that falls on the mountains of Zion. And there the Lord has pronounced his blessing, even life everlasting. That's a, this is an awesome passage of scripture. And there's so much good stuff going on in that passage. I could preach a whole sermon over, that, over this passage. I'm not going to do it. So thank the Lord, right, that you don't have to hear that sermon too today. But, but this song was written for pilgrims who were on their way to Jerusalem to celebrate the the Passover together. So all the pilgrims would be coming from all over Jerusalem. They would be walking together, and they would be singing this song together as they approached Jerusalem. That's why the song was written. 
And I want you to imagine, like looking around at a crowd of people who are walking together to Jerusalem to worship, looking around at this crowd of people and singing the same song together as you're walking on that road. I want you to imagine how beautiful that is, how beautiful that would be to have that feeling, right? God's harmony is beautiful. Everyone's raising their voice together to worship the Lord God. Guys, this is how our, our, our marriages are supposed to work. I mean, we get a little glimpse of it. Like this morning, we're gathered together singing. I want you to know that sometimes when I'm standing up here, when I'm leading worship, and I'm looking out at all of you, and you are, and you are pressing in to worship, you are leaning in, you are singing with passion to the Lord God together, I want you to know it is beautiful. It's amazing. That kind of harmony is beautiful and amazing. And it's that kind of harmony that you and I are supposed to have in our marriages. We're supposed to be together, worshiping God, right? An expression of harmony uh, together. Just like uh, this gathering on Sunday morning is supposed to be an expression of harmony in the body of Christ. And let me say this. What if, what if you're experiencing disunity in your marriage because you've allowed your love and devotion to God to slip? I mean, that's what's uniting all of the people who were on their way to Jerusalem to worship, wasn't it? Their love of God, their devotion to God, their commitment to Him. They're walking together to celebrate together, to worship together. And that was what was, what was uniting them. And on Sunday morning when we're in this place and we're singing about the love of God together, what's uniting us is that we're overwhelmed by God's love and we're worshiping Him together. And it draws us together. It creates unity among us. And it could be that in your marriage, if you're experiencing disunity this morning, it could, be, it could be that you just have allowed your commitment, your devotion to God as a person, as a couple, to slip. And let me, let me say this this morning. Let me just, I didn't even plan to say this, but let me say this. Let me speak for a second to my, to my brothers, all of you out there who are husbands. I just want to remind you that God has called you to lead in this way in your family. It breaks my heart when it breaks my heart when I see couples where where um, where 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 the, the the wives are having to drag their husbands to church, right? The the wives are having to convince their husbands to be involved in 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 the body of Christ and in serving God and in growing and learning in your relationship with God. It's heartbreaking to me because what that means is that that's men, that's men who are who have abdicated their calling from God, who are giving away the blessing that God. God has given them to be a blessing to their family, to lead their family into holiness and into purity before God. That amazing right, that amazing responsibility that God has given you. Do not pass it up. Do not do it. It's too beautiful. It's too rich. It's too real. Don't miss that chance with your wife. Don't miss that chance with your family to lead in that way. Please don't. And I'm telling you that as someone who has done it. Over and over in my own marriage, even as a pastor, I'm telling you, it breaks my heart to think of the days that I've missed. Don't you miss them too. Experiencing the love of God fills us also with that same kind of love for one another. When we are engaged and, and, and worshiping God and experiencing his love, it, then that love flows out of us. The love that he has for us flows out of us into the people around us. And guess what? It flows out of us into our spouses. When we've experienced grace, we give grace. What if you're experiencing this unity in your marriage this morning because you're not extending grace to one another? Because even though Jesus has loved you in spite of all of your brokenness and all of your flaws, and even in spite of your rebellion against him, he continues to pour himself into you and love you. Even though that has happened in your life, you refuse to love the person closest to you in this world in the same way. Right? When we experience grace, we give it. We have the same if they have the same mind, the same love, and finally the same purpose. This week I watched something awesome. I'm telling you. It's Friday night in Hereford, Texas. 
and uh, we were winning 23. Shallow Waters winning 23 to 18 at halftime, and I'm buckling myself up. I'm like, it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a tight game, right? It's gonna be a tough game. It's gonna be it's gonna toe to toe all game long. I know back and forth. That's how it's gonna be. I'm trying to gear myself up. Going to halftime, coaches make some adjustments. We come out of halftime, and we outscored her for 32 to nothing in the second half. Okay. Some of that is because we had some awesome, awesome uh, players on the field who were doing a great job last night. But you know what? Herford did too. The difference, aside from just remarkable coaching, but that's something we'll get to another day. The difference is, you, when you've got, football is the greatest team sport in the world. You can learn so much about life from football. Uh, in fact, it may, be the, it may be the greatest sport in the world. I'm just throwing it out there. But you can learn so much about life from it because here's the thing. You have 11 guys out there on the field at any given time, and there's no way for you to be successful unless all 11 of those guys are trying to accomplish the same thing. All 11 of those guys have to know what their job is in order for each play to be successful, and they all have to do their job. If one of the 11, it doesn't matter how talented, you may have a, a couple of people on your team who are super talented. It doesn't matter how talented they are. If one person out of that 11 doesn't do what they're supposed to do, then you will not find success. That's why I love football. That's why I love to watch it. And what I watched on Friday night was I watched, I watched these guys go out there, 11, 11 young men go out there, and time after time after time, all 11 of those guys were focused, laser focused, on succeeding in each play. It's awesome. When it works, when it's going right, it's awesome to watch. Can I just say, friends, that, that is exactly, that's exactly the ways our, our marriages are supposed to work? It's supposed to be a joy for people to watch us operate in our marriages because we are laser focused on, 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 on what it means to have success in our marriages, on what it means to successfully serve God. We're laser focused on the purpose. And we know each of us have different jobs to do to make that happen. But every day we get up and we're laser focused on it and we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. And we're hanging in there even when it's tough and we're making it happen every day. That's what marriage is supposed to look like. Have you ever wondered, what is your purpose? What's your purpose as a married couple? If you're married here today, what's your purpose? I can tell you what it is. You ready for this? To glorify God. That's your purpose. What if all of the married couples in this room got up every day and they thought, how can we, in our relationship with one another, glorify God today? What if we were laser focused on that purpose? Let me ask you another question. What is it that God has called you and your spouse to as a couple? Because believe me, he has. And it's not. Look, the, the call, God has not called you and your spouse to live in a certain kind of house. He hasn't. He has not called you and your spouse to drive a certain kind of car or make a certain amount of money. He has not called you and your spouse, right, to, to provide certain things for your children. All those are good things. And they're things that you and I should and can have. And, and we can provide for our kids. All those, all those are good things. That's not your purpose. That is not your purpose as a couple. Your purpose as a couple is to expand the kingdom of God. To take the light of the gospel into the darkest places in this world. And every married couple in this room should understand that and know that. God has put you together like a military unit. So that you can advance. That's his agenda in the world today. And so that lost people, broken people, hurting people, wounded people all around you will come to know the healing, transforming love of Christ because of what God is doing in you and your spouse. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And when I ask you, what has God called you to do? If you can't answer that question, friends, if there's not an answer that comes to your heart, then we've got to work on that. Where is God using us to shine his light into the darkness? We should be able to respond to that question as a married couple. we got to have the same purpose. So unity. Paul challenges them to unity, but Paul also challenges them to humility. And this is where it's going to get rough, friends, and I just don't know any other way to do it but just say the truth, okay? But here's what it says in verse, in verse 3. Listen to this. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. That word that's translated humility in this passage, actually in contemporary literature in Paul's day, that word was used in a derogatory way. 
Like anybody who, anybody who demonstrated humility, right, was weak. They were pathetic, right? They were, they were, to, be, they were to be swept aside, right? The, the strong, the successful would never have exhibited this. Friends, did you know that the only reason why humility is a value that is viewed in a, in a good light in our world today is because of Jesus Christ? Do you know that? In the ancient world, in the Roman world, in the Greek world, humility was a weakness. Nobody, nobody wanted that. And, and what Jesus did is he came to earth and then he clothed himself in humility. And he led this radical revolution that caused him to be despised, to be looked down on, to be made fun of, to be spat upon, right? Because he wanted to demonstrate that this thing is worth it. I bet a lot of us would describe ourselves as humble. I would. In fact, of all of my wonderful qualities, humility is the greatest one of them. Right? We want to think of ourselves as humble. But how many of us, how many of us treat our spouse as if they are better than us? How many of us consider our spouse as better than us, before us, more important than us? That's what Paul's talking about. And your relationships with other people, that's what it means to have humility, to consider someone else's needs before your own. And that's what we're being called to here. Here's what it would require for you to think of your wife as better than you. It would require an acknowledgement that we often make mistakes, that we're not always aware of our own motives, and that our motives sometimes are selfish. We would have to be able to acknowledge that we, that lives inside of us. And then it would also require this, a refusal to assume the worst about the motives of our spouse if we considered them as better than us. Some of us, it's clear we don't consider our spouse as better than us. We're not exhibiting humility in our marriage because every time our wife says something to us, we assume that the worst about what she's doing. We assume the worst of her motives. It's like we imagine when our wife woke up this morning, she woke up today thinking, how can I make him miserable? That's what we think. And sometimes, it's a, sometimes wives, we look at our husbands and we think to ourselves, he woke up today thinking, how could he make me miserable? That's what he's doing. We assume the worst about our motives. And when we do that, that we're saying, I'm a better person than my spouse because I don't do that. And friends, I can tell you, I've been so guilty of this so many times in my marriage. If I consider Amy as better than me, I have to assume the best of her motives. I have to give her the benefit of the doubt. I have to assume that it's way more likely that I have messed up than she has messed up. And that's what humility is. A lot of us, a lot of us our, our marriages are, are struggling because we're blind to our own selfish motivations and our own shortcomings. And we assume that our spouses are constantly driven by the same shortcomings we pretend we don't have. This morning, this morning, do you, uh, it, could be that, it could be that you're experiencing disunity in your marriage this morning because, um, because you're trying to fulfill your own desires in your marriage. You're trying, to, you're trying to get this other person to make you happy. And that's kind of your goal in your marriage. We never acknowledge how special and precious our spouse is because we're just too focused on our own needs. Some of us this morning are experiencing disunity because we're more concerned with everyone thinking what a great husband or what a great spouse we are, right? Than we are with actually being a great spouse to our husband, to our, to our wife, right? We're more concerned with what other people think about us than we are what our spouses know of us. How many of us, <laughs> I told you I shouldn't be preaching this message. I'm just, how many of us find it easy to talk about how much we love our spouse on social media, right? But we find it so difficult to express how much we love them face to face or over a romantic dinner or even in the bedroom. How, how come that's more complicated? 
And I, look, I love it. I love it when people brag about their spouses on social media or in public. I think that's healthy. I think it's good. But when we do that, sometimes, sometimes our motive is not to lift up our spouse. Sometimes our motive is to make other people feel good about us. And that's not humility. Last thing, he challenges the church to be helpful. He challenges them to helpfulness. Look what he says. Look what he says. He says, um, don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. Listen. So often in our marriages, we're focused on what advances us, what makes us better. And that's easy because we know, or at least we think we know, what we want or what we need, right? But that's not how relationships in Christ Jesus are supposed to work. I want for you to look at what Paul says to husbands in Ephesians chapter 5. Listen to this. He starts this whole little deal with submit to one another in love. And then in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, he says, for husbands... This means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or a wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she'll be holy and without fault in the same way. Husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. Y'all, in the ancient world, the world from which Paul is writing, marriage existed to benefit husbands. That's why it was instituted. And Paul burns that down in this radical and revolutionary way. In Ephesians chapter 5, he blasts that cultural understanding. He says, husbands, lay your life down for your wife. That's what he said. I read an article the other day, and it was about... So this lady, um, this, this, this lady was over at her friend's house, and her friend was married. And, so, and they had just had a baby, and they would invited some friends over. You know, the baby was still little. And so anyway, the dinner was cooking, and the baby was crying and needed to be fed. And the, so the mom was leaving to do that, and, and the friends were here, and the husband's kind of hanging out, talking with the friends, and the mom would come in and try to talk to the friends and cook dinner and then go feed the baby. And then, and then something happened with the dinner, and it boiled over, and she was, ah, you know, she's trying to fix this, and it's it kind of baby's crying, all kind of stressful. You guys who are, have kids, you know what I'm talking about, right? You've been here. And, and the husband said this. The husband said, honey, is there any way that I can help you right now? And in the husband's mind, he thought, what a good husband I'm being. I can see my wife is stressed out. I need to help her, right? right? And the wife was like, no, no, uh, I think I got it. I think I got it. And what the writer of the article wanted to point out is this. In that wife's mind and in the, in the mind of a lot of the ladies here among us, right, what's going on in their heads all the time is, let's see, I've got to get, I've got to get the kids to this place, and then they've got to get to this place, and then I've got to do this at my job, and then I also have to make sure that dinner is prepared, and I've got to make sure that this is done, and I've got to make sure that that's taken care of, and oh gosh, we've got to make sure we pay this bill, we've got to make sure I turn that off on, right, right, all these kinds of, is the garage door shut, is the garage door open? That's going on in their minds all the time, all the time. You know what's going on in my mind? I wonder who the Cowboys play Sunday, you know? And the reality is that sometimes what my wife needs, the reality is that sometimes what my wife, my, my wife just needs for me to just take some of that stuff off of her plate without her having to ask for it, to notice that there's all these things whirring around in her life all the time. And if I could just step into that a little bit and help out with that, it would mean a lot. I mean, some of us, man, we want to get home at night. We want, we want for our wives to know that we love them, and so we turn off the lights, we light some candles, we start talking like Barry White. You know what I mean? <laughs> Baby, you know I love you, right? That's what we do. And our wives are thinking, could you just unload the freaking dishwasher? Could you do that? <laughs> How about you just take the trash out for the love of all that's holy? Could you do that, Right? And guys, the, the reality is that in our marriages, sometimes that's how things are going. We're, we're, look, we're trying to be humble, right? We're trying to have unity. But when it comes to being helpful, we're not being helpful because we sometimes don't even know how to, we're not even asking. We're not even trying to like put ourselves in the other person's shoes so that we can know what is it that they need, right? And I do this, I'm terrible about it. And frankly, m- friends who are men, we struggle with this a lot, Right? And I just want to encourage us. We got, to, we got to find ways to be helpful to our spouse. Because here's the deal. Listen, did you know this? Did you know that God has called you? 
God has called you to help your spouse become all that God has created them to be. One day, you and I will, if we're married, we will stand before God and he will ask, how did you help your spouse become all that I created them to be? What did you do? And, and, and Paul says it. Did, the, the, Jesus was delivering the church holy and spotless. Right? That's what his job was. That's what he did. That's why he laid his life down. In our marriages, are we laying our lives down to deliver our spouses holy and without blemish to Almighty God? Is that what we're doing? If it's not, if that's not our goal, if that's not our purpose to help with that, to encourage with that, to move them toward that, if that's not what we're doing, what are we doing? We're abdicating the responsibility that God has given us, the privilege, the honor that God has given us to be that for our spouse. We can be Jesus to our spouse. We've been given that privilege. One time I wrote a song for Amy. It was the first song that I wrote for her after we got married, and I didn't have any idea when I wrote the song, I didn't have any idea how true the words were going to be, right? Uh, the last verse of the song, it's called Miracle. If you're on you version, there's actually a link to the, the iTunes, you know, so you can listen to it, not now, uh, some other time. But the last verse of the song says, it says, I, I know my mind is too small to comprehend his ways or fully grasp his love. And though I try to make the Father real to me, sometimes I just don't have faith enough. But when I feel your heartbeat next to me, I know that I've found living proof. I believe in miracles because I believe in you. I had no idea. I had no idea that one day I was going to experience the love of Jesus more rich and more real than I've ever experienced it in my life in Amy. I had no idea. I had no idea that, when, that there was going to come a time in life when I thought about the love of Christ, I would think about my wife. But that's the truth. That's what's happened. That's what she's done for me. That's what we get to do for one another. Don't you want to be that? Don't you want to be that for the person that's closest to you in the world? Well, here's the truth. By the power of the Holy Spirit, you can. You can be that for your spouse this morning. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I want you to ask these questions of the Lord. And we're going to have some t a time of worship. Our worship team is going to come up. We're going to have a time of worship. But I want for you to ask these questions of yourself this morning. I want you to ask and I want you to ask God, okay? But then later I want you to ask these questions to your spouse too, okay? I know, that's your assignment for this week. Not easy, but I want you to do it. Here's the questions. How can I promote unity in our marriage? Here's another one. How do I need to humble myself in our marriage? Here's another one. How can I help my spouse? How can I help them? And the last one, are you ready? Does my spouse see Christ's character in me? Ask that of the Lord first, because then whenever you hear the answer from your spouse, it won't sting as much, okay? But it's time that we, it's time that we made these questions our, our boundaries in our marriages. It's time we tried to live into that in our marriages. Don't you think? Let me pray for us. Father, thank you so much for your presence here this morning, for your conviction, for speaking to us. God, help us, help us to be people who in every relationship in our lives, Lord, we live out and embody your character. God, I pray right now that you would convict us where we need to be convicted that you would lay our souls bare and that you would give us the courage to ask for forgiveness from you 
and also ask for forgiveness from, from any, any people in our lives that we need to ask forgiveness from. Give us the courage to seek healing in our marriages, in our relationships, and in you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Listen, as we sing, I really want for you to allow the Spirit to work in your heart this morning. Don't miss this chance to have the Lord really speak to you and, and, and really do his healing work in you. If you need someone to pray for you, the, this door right over here has got a sign that says, how can I pray for you? There's some folks that have a t-shirt on that says, how can I pray for you? They came this morning because they want to pray for you. And if you need prayer, if you and your spouse need prayer, it, you can go right to that door right over there. Someone will meet you at that door and they'll take you and they'll pray for you. But whatever you do, don't miss this opportunity to allow the Lord to work and to mend and to move in your life. Stand up, let's worship.
tonight. You can be seated. Listen, um, so uh, I just want to make sure that I say if, if there's, if, if, if anyone here, there may be some folks here, you're struggling, you're having a difficult time, and maybe you just need some help. Maybe you just need to talk to somebody. Um, I just want to say that, that uh, I love, as your pastor, being able to do that. And Amy and I actually really uh, love to be able to uh, help other, other couples, particularly when they're going through difficult times, because we've been through our share of them. And, uh, and so I want to make sure that I say that to you. We also have a, a, a list that we keep in our, in our office of actual professional counselors that can help. And so I just want to make sure that we, we're giving you all the resources that you need in order to be healthy uh, in your marriage, okay? So please let us know if there's any way we can serve you beyond just, you know, uh, Sunday morning. We want to do that, okay? Um, we're going to enter into a time of offering. Right now, our uh, ushers are down, coming down here to the front, and, uh, and we're going to have our, our offering now. This is just the time where we uh, give back to God from all that He has given to us. And, uh, and so we're going to receive our offering. And uh, while we're doing that, the one and the only Sandy Peters is going to have some great announcements for us. So let's pray together. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for this offering we're about to receive. Lord, I pray that you would multiply it like loaves and fishes. I pray that uh, it would go all over the world, Lord, for the sake of your kingdom. And that others would come to know you because of the work that you're going to do right here through, through this offering that we're about to receive. Thank you for doing that. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, Sandy. You got an amen there, too. Uh, <laughs> all right. So uh, there's a couple of guys that work here at the church uh, so much that people think they're on staff. Mm. Lyndall and Doug, they're going to kill me for doing this. Stand up for just a second. Doug's Both of right you, Lyndall. Oh, Doug's, they're, they're, oh, they're already standing up. They're, they're doing yep, there you go. They're on staff. So anyway, they work hard. They do, they do a ton of stuff around here without ever asking for anything for it. So you get a chance to help them. This Saturday at 8 o'clock, we're having a, a work day here at the church. Where we'll have something for everybody. You're not too old. You're not the wrong gender. Come and help us. we got plenty of, plenty of work to do. We're going to have a work day at 8. Uh, and come, come as long as you can uh, to help. So that's, that's this Saturday at 8. Uh, if you have a grill, uh, like, you know, that you pull behind and you go... To tailgate and you think oh i'm just wasting my time going to tailgate and you know and and the football games are up and down and sometimes they lose and you want to donate that to the church that'd be awesome mm -hmm. or if you want to build one that'd be awesome so the guys who uh, also work very hard uh cooking for us all the time would love to have a grill that they could use and so uh the last thing uh or maybe the next to last or i don't know i might keep going but uh we're Brad's going to start a series here before too long called You Ask For It. So are there, are there, there are things that you just want to know? Like, here's, here's an example. Discombobulated, okay? If you're combobulated, does that mean you're in good shape? But when you're discombobulated, you're not? I've always wanted to know. Brad can answer that. Brad, that's something no. that Brad can answer. Here's another one. On the back of shampoo, the instructions say, lather, rinse, repeat. Okay, when do you stop? <laughs> Brad can answer that, right? Yeah, clearly. Okay. Clearly, okay. I have a so, lot of knowledge. There may be more deeper questions, <laughs> like questions about church, about God, about uh, uh, how do I hear God's voice? Uh, why does God allow tragedy? Uh, certainly, there's important things. There's a card. Hopefully, most of you got this card when you walked in. And, and we allow for old school and no, new school. Maybe not no school. <laughs> anyway, old school, new school. You can write down on here and put your question on here, write it down with a pen, that's right. You get a writing instrument, you write it down, put it in the uh, offering plate, or there's a QR code there where you can do it online and ask your question. Brad's gonna take every single question, and he, okay, he's gonna have to kind of pare it down, but he's gonna pick some of the really good questions and uh, over uh, a series, is it one week? Three weeks. Three weeks. Three weeks, he's going to answer our questions. So there you go. All right, I'm done. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, and uh, uh, just so you know, uh, I'm, I'm not answering them because I have all the answers, because I totally don't. But I believe that, that the, the Word of God has got some answers, you know. And so we'll take some of those questions and we'll do our best to address them. Uh, all too often in church, you know, we have, we, we, we have things that we wonder about and we're not sure about. We have questions that roll around. We feel like we're not able to ask them. And I don't want First Shallow Water to be a, to be a place where people feel like there's, there's things that they can't ask the Lord, you know? It's just, that's not who God is. And so, uh, you have questions, ask them. And we'll do our best to address as many of them as we possibly can 
over uh, three weeks beginning October the 16th uh, is when we're going to start that. So I'm giving you plenty of time to be able to ask some questions. All right? Okay. Uh, I am so grateful to be your pastor. Uh, if you would, stand up and let me just benedict us. Really, it, when I tell you I'm grateful to be your pastor, it's a privilege that I don't deserve. And, uh, and I'm really honored uh, to be able to be doing life with all of you guys. It's an amazing privilege in my life, and I'm so thankful for it. So, uh, but this morning, a- as we leave, uh, I want for us to just let, uh, let Paul's uh, words ring out to us this morning. Uh, beginning with verse 2. Make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, working together with one mind and one purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourself. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. Let's let those words echo in our hearts and in our heads as we go this morning. I love you guys. Have a great week. I'll see you next Sunday.